Well, looky here, a nice, premium, smaller phone. All right, gadget nerds, I'm going to do this once. I'm going to wipe off the phone once at the very beginning of this uh, video, this little hands-on here for the Xiaomi 13. And then from here on out, you're just going to have to deal with any handling fingerprints that are caused by me showing off this phone. Conclusion at the top of this video, this is a great little phone. I have a few concerns with some of Xiaomi's release strategy because it feels like we were just recently talking about the 12T series. The Xiaomi 13 comes right on the heels of what was already a pretty killer collection of phones, and sometimes I feel this kind of confuses the conversation, makes it a little bit more difficult to shop the best deal. That little caveat out of the way, I really like the design language changes from the 12T to the 13, the evolution of the nicer series of Xiaomi phones. This looks really sharp. I like the color options, and I especially like the broad, flat sides. I'm sure we could psychoanalyze some of this design language behavior and maybe point to another manufacturer that might be inspiring some of this build language, but I really like flat sides. I think it's easier to hold onto the phone to operate it, especially when you're using it like a camera. I've loved flat sides on Sony devices. I love flat sides here. I love flat screens on Sony devices. I love flat screens here. The standard Xiaomi 13 arrives as the competitor device to phones like a Galaxy S23. We've already seen the international pricing announced. I am reviewing the 12 gig of RAM, 256 gig of storage model, which is going to retail for around 999 euro, depending on market and availability and distribution. This phone exists as a clear shot at Samsung strategy. This phone exists as a clear shot somewhere in between a Galaxy S23 and an S23 Plus. Literally getting into the size of the phone, this is ever so slightly a little bit taller than a Galaxy, and it has that taller aspect ratio, but it's about the same width, and when we compare it against something that is known for being tall and skinny, we're not too far off the overall dimensions of something like my Xperia 5. The Xperia 5 is ever so slightly a little narrower and ever so slightly a little taller. And this is the difference between 21 by 9 and 20 by 9. 1080p front face, again, that beautiful flat edge just going across the top. I feel this makes interactions, especially when apps have any kinds of controls out to the sides of your screen, just a little bit easier. Always going to be happy to see an IR blaster at the top of the phone. And popping out that pin tool, we do have a dual SIM card tray here on the bottom. Unfortunately, this is a Xiaomi, so so this USB port here is not USB 3, it's still USB 2 and does not support video output. One of those deciding factors when we're talking about different brands and manufacturers, if someone were to veer towards a Galaxy, I'd really be highlighting features like DeX. If you're not using something like DeX or desktop modes or you don't need video output, USB 2 is a little pokey, but it's still kind of fine. One of my criticisms on the Xiaomi 12S Ultra, I shot a ton of content on this phone. It is kind of noticeable when you're transferring large 4K video files and tons of photos and raw photos off of a little USB 2 port because the Xiaomi 13 is also another partnership with Leica and we're going to talk about these camera sensors here in just a bit. But again, transferring tons of footage off of USB 2, you got to be just a little more patient. I saw the little fingerprint sensor in the display. There's a pre-installed uh, screen protector. I'd say the performance on this is very good, but I still, I do miss the sort of golden age of Xiaomi power button fingerprint sensors. I thought they were just even a little bit more rabbity getting you into your phone. We're running MIUI 14 on Android 13, and performance has been absolutely fantastic. MIUI still sets a standard for a bouncier, more vibrant, more playful skin, but without sacrificing performance. And especially that this is powered by the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, Nothing is slowing this phone down. This phone is an absolute monster. I think it's just kind of interesting where skins go, and I had something similar to say about FunTouch on iQoo's. When you pull down your notification shade and you have sort of the stock Android layout, notifications down here and kind of quick toggles up here, this looks a lot like Android 11. We're using the smaller button toggles. We're driving an even bigger wedge between what sort of stock Android looks like, what a Pixel version of Android is going to look like, and then some of these more custom polished skins delivering different 
different UI experiences. But I just can't overstate, this thing is so phenomenally smooth. And as opposed to the new animation engine on OnePlus and Oppo devices, I like that Xiaomi is keeping MIUI just a little bit punchier. Each one of these slides just feels that little bit snappier, and yet we're still not running into those issues where you occasionally see a little frame jank. And I gotta show this off because it's something that I often reference on Xiaomi devices. You know, when we're talking about software and security and sort of a Chinese ROM versus a global ROM, I've had some criticisms on some of the pre-installed apps. Now I've already uninstalled a bunch of things, like this comes pre-installed with Facebook, Facebook and with LinkedIn and with TikTok. But one of the things that I often showcase is the permissions requested when you use something simple like the calculator app. I haven't done anything. I haven't approved any of those permissions. It just pops up. The calculator app is ready to go. In Xiaomi's in the past, I've been a little concerned about, hey, we're going to monitor some of your behavior and send that up for analytics. And like, I don't really need you to track my calculator behavior. And going to the calculator app in our app settings, I haven't allowed any special permission. So I'd like to call this just a little bit of progress as phones are having to comply with international regulations on data security and consumer privacy. I'm, I'm gonna say that not having a calculator nag screen is a small step of improvement. I've had the phone for a little bit. I've been playing around with it for a little bit more than a week and it really is just a monster performer. I, I, I've been going through and doing some of my tests and benchmarks. I'm gonna put together a whole new graph with this phone and then also also adding the Note 23 to my performance testing lineup. I'm having to revise a few things because Geekbench has just upgraded to Geekbench 6 and all of the scores are different. Now I would show you this here in the Geekbench app, but now Geekbench 6 doesn't save <laughs> our tests, which is totally counterproductive. If you're gonna be benchmarking your own phone, you want a history of those. So unfortunately now we have to go in and we have to screenshot them. I genuinely don't know what's good in Geekbench right now. Geekbench 6 just rolled over. So this is the score as it stands using the phone in its normal mode. And then you can go into your battery settings and highlight a high performance mode. And when you do that, the numbers get bigger. Whoa, look at that, that, that number got 30% bigger, I guess it's 30% more better. This is what I think is so fascinating this year in the SOC industry, talking about the chips that go into our phones. I genuinely believe you could take a significant hit to the main CPU compute power on our phones and no one would notice. This right here is representative of performance that is phenomenal overkill for getting the basics done for average consumers. I really like this solution better than pretending we've got AI on the phone that can figure out what apps and services need more power. I mean, this is it. I go into my settings, I go down to the battery, and then I look at save battery balanced and performance. I'm a grown up, and I just want the throttle control to go directly to performance mode and know that the phone is gonna cook itself, but it's gonna give me everything that it can do. But genuinely kicking it down to the balance mode, this is still, like I said, ridiculous overkill for just running the phone on the daily. The battery life has been pretty good, but I've not run it very hard on my own personal SIM. Again, we're talking about different regions with different bands and different network support. So as an LTE device, which is mostly what this was getting here in my neck of the woods, I would say it was good, but I can't really comment on what this is gonna be like as a daily driver in a 5G compatible network environment. What I will point out is how well accessorized this phone is in the big chunky box. You see, we like the big chunky box because the big chunky box not only gives us a nice pretty phone, it also gives us a little protector case. Oh, that's not even the right bumper case. <laughs> it gives us a nice little bumper case. There we go. That's the correct bumper for this phone. Oh, the plights of being a tech reviewer. But it's just something to get you started. I don't think you should live in this case, but out of the box, you, you have something to protect your phone until you can get something else. Now, we were just talking about battery life, but one of the, the best things about shopping an international phone that comes well accessorized is it comes with a charger in the box. And it not only comes, with a charger in the box. It comes with a 67 watt charger in the box. So not only is this a significantly faster charging standard than what a Galaxy S23 can achieve, you don't need to spend extra to get this faster charging. If you're buying a Galaxy and you're just comparing MSRP to MSRP at $999 for 256 gigs of storage, you also have to add the cost of a slower charger 
to your Galaxy S23 purchase. While I was talking about performance, I got a little you know, sort of scattered there, but I have run a few tests. We're looking at like video rendering performance, been looking at podcast mixing, and this is neck and neck with some of the best options available today, in, in, including significantly more expensive phones. The Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 has just been an absolute joy to take to high performance compute tasks. We're really just getting into specific optimization on devices. This 8 Gen 2 is neck and neck with a Note 23, and it's still just that tiny little bit slower than a Pixel 7 Pro in a video rendering test. Something about LumaFusion really likes the Pixel 7 Pro. But the overall best balance of battery life and performance and gaming, the 8 Gen 2 has been an absolute champ. We do need to talk about the camera performance just a bit. This is another collaboration with Leica. This is not the Xiaomi 13 Pro, so we're not dealing with the really exciting, super cool one inch type sensor. This is now moving us down into a premium tier camera experience, but not an ultra or a pro tier camera experience. Those badges, they do mean something when we're talking about different categories of phone. This is good camera performance. It's very good camera performance. The main sensor on the back of this phone is reminiscent of phones like the OnePlus 9 Pro. This is a slightly larger main camera sensor than what you're going to find on an S23 or an S23 Plus. I doubt you'll notice significantly different optical performance against a thousand dollar Samsung, but you're still going to be in for a treat with a high quality main camera shooter. And I think some of these companies are getting a little bit smarter about how they're dividing up the sensor duties. But I think there's going to be a fun debate on the main sensor, the resolution, and the equivalent focal length. So do we want a dedicated two times zoom portrait mode, or can we use pixels on the main camera to kind of punch us in to a roughly 50 millimeter equivalent field of view, get that nice kind of portrait focal length. This Xiaomi is doing something kind of interesting. That two times punch in comes from that main camera sensor, and then it's not going to focus here on the table, but that 3.2 is the third camera sensor, which gives us a little bit more additional reach on top of that. But of course, a couple frustrations when we're talking about Xiaomi or BBK phones, we don't have matched sensor performance. So if you want to just shoot at the top quality video, the phone will change up your video settings depending on which sensor you go with. So the ultra wide switches this over to 4K24. Can we do 4K30? Uh, we can. Can we do 4K60? No, we can't. So as you move, it's going to ch start changing the sensors. It's like we've got to pick different frustrations. On some phones, it just blocks out your ability to use that. So like if the ultra wide can't shoot 4K60 and you're in 4K60, then the ultra wide setting just disappears from your phone. That's frustrating because it looks like a part of your phone is broken or that it's missing a feature. The flip side of that is if you automatically change the video when you change the camera sensor, Nothing alerted the user here that something changed on the camera setting. So if you were shooting 4K60 and you're like, oh, but I just need a wider field of view and you tap that ultra wide, changes what you're shooting. So then you go back and the camera will remember that you were shooting 4K60. But if you go back and look at that footage later, it's gonna be a significant mismatch going from ultra wide at 24p to standard wide at 60p. That's gonna be frustrating and that there's no conveyance, that there's no alert from the phone that that's what's going on. The rest of the camera app is fantastically laid out though. I've always loved Xiaomi's manual modes. We have voice shutter, we've got focus peaking, there's a high resolution 50 megapixel mode. Optical quality, I think this is one of the exciting things about partnering with actual camera brands. The optical quality that we're seeing on these phone lenses now is starting to get really good. I've got a video coming out comparing the Note 23 against one inch sensor phones. And just for fun, I shot some clarity samples from this camera too, and even though it's working at a sensor size disadvantage, we're really close to the optical performance of the main sensor on the Note 23. It's just gonna be the bummer that an iPhone or a Galaxy at this price point is gonna do a better job of matching all of the features across all of the sensors. Please pardon, brief interruption, we gotta thank this video sponsor, you. The videos on this channel would literally not be possible without the generous contributions from the folks on my Patreon, patreon.com slash some gadget guy. And over the couple of years that I've been running that Patreon, it's just proven to be an incredible community that really does help me take my content up to the next level. But we never want supporting content creators to feel like a burden, especially for folks who might be struggling right now. In an age of algorithms, those folks who are out there sharing content on social media, posting it to appropriate subreddits, bringing new fun tech geeks to the conversation, that kind of effort means the world 
to creators like me. But if you have the means and you would like to contribute, please consider checking out patreon.com slash some gadget guy. I'm writing up additional posts, production diaries. It's where my camera deep dives and camera analysis articles live. You get the 4K videos without the ads built into them. And we also have our own little private discord, which is my safe space to nerd out. Once again, patreon.com slash some gadget guy. Thank you all so much for the support, the contributions. These videos would not be possible without you. And now let's get back to the rest of the video. And just a quick little detail on gaming performance. I haven't done a ton of game benchmarking on this phone yet, but one of the games that I always like to show off is Undead Horde. Now this game is not super graphics intense. You can see it's cute little uh, polygon minions that are kind of floating around on your screen, but this has been one of the best Xiaomi's yet for playing this game. Xiaomi will regu regularly let your GPU just scale up and run really hot, and then it can kind of throttle games like this. There's a ton of activity happening and you've got to control all of these little minion and you've got to fight a ton of little enemies and so the frame rate can spike and crash and spike and crash on previous Xiaomi phones. The 13 does a much better job of kind of balancing out some of that ebb and flow um, and you can see as I'm going through this this is an area where on previous Xiaomi devices the gameplay would turn into a slideshow. I'm still finding a few stutters it's getting a little janky but this is a game that struggles to play well on portable consoles. We're actually able to keep a higher average frame rate here than if I were playing this on a Nintendo Switch. This isn't the best version of this game on an Android, but this is much better than previous Xiaomi's that I've run through this test. Again, I love knowing that a phone is going to give me all of its performance, but if we can't adequately cool and keep a higher sustained performance, then that's really not fun for gaming. And this is where I think we can wrap up our first look at the Xiaomi 13, a really solid phone, a very nice premium built, expensive looking, expensive feeling, high performance option that's also going to cater to someone who wants something just a little bit smaller. I think this is a, a fun challenge as we're looking at some of the other sort of crossover phones that are coming out for the international market. Devices like the iQ11 and the OnePlus 11 are not doing dual device strategies internationally. So they're trying to wrap up all the pros and cons into one device, and that means you end up with something that's probably going to be a little bit bigger because consumers tend to lean towards bigger devices, but that leaves folks who like smaller phones out in the cold. So I really want to give Xiaomi a thumbs up because they're still holding to a two device release in international markets. Just taking a look at this opposite the iQ11, it's noticeably smaller. But in these BBK brands only making one phone, we are, we're also seeing a more aggressive pricing strategy on these devices. As mentioned, the 12 gigs of RAM, 256 gigs of storage is going to be a 999 euro phone. And it feels like an expensive premium phone. But the iQ11 doesn't ask for many compromises, has a few advantages in terms of just pure technology, and is gonna retail for a little less in any of the markets where these two might go head to head. I think this is gonna be a really interesting commentary throughout the year, as I think a, a number of smartphone manufacturers are gonna be looking to streamline, maybe not hit as many individual product releases. So when we have a good option for a specific kind of consumer, we've gotta highlight why that's a little bit different and not just look at, does it have the same processor and giggle bits and RAMs, but why is it more expensive? Xiaomi hit the ground running with a good, smaller, premium tier option. It's going to do battle against the Galaxy S23 really well, and it's going to be an even more fun fight for those consumers internationally where Samsung is going to be using the same SoC. So in years past, I would have said, hey, the Snapdragon version of this phone versus the Exynos version of that phone, now this is a little more comparable as a direct head-to-head. -head. I have a little more to say about the Xiaomi 13, the 13 series in general. We're really excited to see what the rest of this lineup is going to look like throughout 2023. So not only stay tuned, but if you have specific questions, or if there's something you want to see me test specifically, you got to drop me some of those comments down below. And on your way to the comments, you should probably smash that bell icon. As always, thanks so much for watching, for sharing these videos, supporting the channel in general. All of you who are checking out links in my descriptions, if you're going to my home site, somegadgetguide.com, or if you're joining the list of names, scrolling by on your screen from my Patreon. Patreon.com slash some gadget guy. This list is basically the coolest collection of tech pals in the omniverse. So I hope you'll check them out. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet at some gadget guy on the Twitters and the Twitch, spending a lot more time on the Mastodon. I'm going to try and put a few camera samples up on my revived Flickr account, but not so much on the Facebooks or the Instagrams. And I will catch you all on the next video.